who are the greats? Who are the greats in any area that would be considered and measured? This is a question, no matter the area or interest, everybody at some point weighs in on, depending on their particular interest. Perhaps the question is, who is the greatest basketball player? In fact, this question goes often and on and on so often, you become almost nauseated by the question. LeBron or Jordan? But who are the greatest, who is the greatest philosopher of all time? Plato or Socrates? The greatest soccer player of all time? Ronaldo or Messi? The greatest president? Lincoln or Reagan? People debate all the time who they think are the greatest, and depending on whether or not they're using the same scorecard, the same rubric of measuring determines whether or not they agree and assess it accordingly. Who are the greatest? Even Christians can get on this. Who is the the greatest preacher of our lifetime? Who is the most prolific writer? Who is the greatest apostle in the New Testament? We even saw the church getting this in 1 Corinthians as they almost had their like divisions. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of Paul. I'm of Christ. As they'd often speak to their own immaturity about how they began to pit their religious heroes against each other and sort of create and support their own divisions accordingly. The human heart is inclined to organize and rank anything from the greatest quarterback to the greatest Thanksgiving meal. And and I know what it is. It happens at my house. Well, this is not unique to our time. Even Jesus gets drawn into this kind of conversation. In our passage this evening in Matthew 22... He is being asked about the greatest. But he's not being asked about the greatest rabbi or the greatest prophet. Jesus tonight is being asked about the greatest command. And according to the biblical record of the Old Testament, the rabbis found that there were commands that they wanted to see that he ranked. In fact, of all the commands of what we refer to in the Old Testament, the rabbis kind of categorize them as being a total of 613 commands. And so they come to him and they say, Jesus, O oh great teacher, what is the greatest command? And he's not just being asked by anyone. He's being asked by a scribe, a, and essentially a lawyer who specializes in the Bible. Well, tonight... We're going to preserve some time, as I said just a minute ago, in our time to interact with some announcements about the church. So I said we're going to have a time later tonight to have some Q&A time. And that Q&A time is with the expressed intention to be able to answer sincere questions you have. The hope when you have a time of Q&A is that the person asking the question is a humble learner, not a hostile interrogator. If you sense there's a hostile interrogator and someone's asking a question, you're like, what are, we, what are we doing here? I feel like we're wasting our time. You're really making a statement in the form of a question. We've all had this kind of interaction with people before. Well, tonight, as we're about to see in the text, Jesus is not being asked questions by humble learners. He's being asked questions again and again and again by hostile interrogators, trying to expose him trying to indeed in some way defame him, trying ultimately to arrest him and eventually kill him. And this is no different than what we see here tonight. Jesus' Q&A sessions are often hostile in their intention. So we see this in Matthew 22. Look with me, first of all, verses 34 and 35. But when the Pharisees heard that he, referring to Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, an earlier conversation, verses 23 to 33, it says then, they gathered together, the Pharisees, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. So there's the intention, not to learn from him, but to test him. What is the question? Verse 36, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, just by way of review, for those of you who know and for those of you who do not, by way of introduction, we're introduced here to a group of people that are very common throughout the New Testament, very common throughout the teachings and the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, this group known as the Pharisees. They're not a large group. There's only about 6,000 of them. In fact, Pharisees means, by definition, separated ones. 
they're a, a sect, a group within Judaism who really kind of prided themselves in how they preserve the law, how they sort of protected the holiness of God's Word. And they would do that by even creating more laws that if you didn't break those laws, you would never come close to breaking God's law. So they had sort of laws upon laws. And they are very hostile regularly throughout Jesus' ministry. And Jesus regularly confronts them, as we saw back in Matthew 15, about their self-righteousness, about their hypocrisy. We're going to see more of that in the coming weeks. But what we see here is that Jesus' answer is more than they expected. Because he basically teaches the following, and here's the outline for tonight. Number one, love God with everything you've got. Love God with everything you've got. And then secondly, Jesus teaches, love others like they're the only one you had. Love God with everything you've got, and secondly, love others like they were the only one you had. Now, let's look at Jesus' answer to this question. What is the greatest commandment in the law? Let's now look to verse 37 and verse 38. Jesus responding says this. He said to him, so Jesus referring, now responding to the lawyer, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. So essentially, Jesus is saying you should love God with everything you've got. This is what's coming out of verses 37 and 38. Now, it's a fair presumption that some who are listening in on this conversation, that one is having with another one, would have expected Jesus to kind of rank and pick maybe one of the Ten Commandments. Maybe something in the Decalogue, these Ten Commandments that we see in Exodus and then given again in Deuteronomy. Which, which one of these, Jesus, is the greatest? But others, perhaps, would have been thinking about the larger list, all 613 commands cataloged by them that God had given in the Torah and the prophets and the writings. Which one of these, Jesus? And Jesus' answer is surprising to them. It's surprising because he goes to a place that's so familiar to them. He goes to what's called by Jewish summaries known as the Shema. Now, Shema, unless you're from a Jewish background, you speak Hebrew, that's not familiar to you. Shema is where you get this word, hear. So, Shema is to hear. And it's basically a, how you summarize in Jewish language and, and Jewish cultural religious tradition. It's referring back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 is such a familiar passage to any Jewish person at that time and any many Jewish people today that a religious, devout Jewish person at that time would have been reciting the Shema at least twice a day. So they would know it well. That's exactly what Jesus starts to cite here. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 says as follows, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So Jesus, when being asked what is the greatest commandment, he grabs from, he basically quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, specifically verse 5, and says, there it is. This is the foundation. This idea of sort of weightiest of commands, which one should we direct our attention to? Now, this is profound for the Jewish listener because they're familiar with it, and where he goes is where they maybe did not expect him to go, but where he does go because where he goes in relationship to the person's understanding of God and their life. Now, as Jesus is referencing Deuteronomy, it's worth explaining to you here that God is not trying to be understanding, is breaking it down as if the entire person is somehow in this sort of tri-perspectival personhood, as if there's three parts. There's your heart, there's your soul, there's your mind. This instead is this comprehensive language to say, with all of who you are, you should love the Lord. Your heart, your soul, your mind, these are not rigidly separated compartments for human existence, but reflect that the entire person is given to God. Now, it's worth noting how this is framed as Jesus even references it. I think oftentimes today, by way of cultural compare and contrast, if we're honest, we often think of love as an emotion, something you just 
feel. And until you feel it, you shouldn't show it because that wouldn't be authentic. So you should wait until you feel it so you can be honest with who you are and not manufacture some other type of person It's not really who you are. Friends, this is oftentimes how this has been convoluted today and how to think through the very understanding of love. Love is not an emotion that you simply display. It has emotional implications to it, to be sure, but not an emotional dependence. What we see here is an expression that Jesus is teaching the followers there, the listeners there, and to us today by the teaching of the Holy Spirit, preserving His Word for us even today, that all of our life would be lived out as a display of a love for God. I'm reminded of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, speaking about how, heart, how the heart is so central to the life. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Your heart is this identifiable center of reality as to how you think through things, what it is you are committed to, what it is you're devoted to. But notice the sort of the presupposition here, this idea of loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Well, what does it presuppose? It presupposes that you actually know the Lord. You actually know the Lord. You, you cannot love what you do not know. So there is this understanding, friend, your inability to love God is in direct comparison and connection to whether or not you even know God. I don't mean just know him like as a series of maybe Bible verses or know him in a sense of like a few facts you sort of memorize or maybe know him and that you maybe own a Bible that sort of makes reference to him or know him and that you've been in church a few times. I mean like you like know him like you think about knowing a good relationship, spending time with that person, hearing from them, letting them hear from you. That's what reading in prayer is to the life of a Christian, is to hear from God and to be able to speak to God. Loving God with all of your mind means bringing your mind under his lordship, giving him the throne of your intellectual thought. You have thought that differs from his word, that his word reveals you, you think one way, and his word teaches another way. Friend, to love the Lord means to ask God to forgive you for thinking differently than what he says, and desiring instead to bring your thoughts into alignment with his thoughts. Because he knows best what is, white, what is right and what is good, what is wise and what is true. This is indeed what we see it means to love God even with our mind. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says, We love because he first loved us. Friend, there's a reality here that loving God is a reactive, it is an instinctive response. It is a reactive response to what you've already received. Thomas Manton, the Puritan, said, love is like an echo. It returns what is received. This is what happens with a child of God loving God himself. To be able to see that love. I mean, is this not indeed what we see in the most famous verse in all the Bible? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would what? Would not perish but have everlasting life. To be loved by God to such an extent that he has laid down his life for you and for me. Oh, for the Lord to love people like that, for him to love his bride like that. We see this as being a display of loving God with everything you've got. But that takes us in secondly, Jesus continuing his answer in verses 39 and 40. Look at what it says in verses 39 and 40. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, in case you missed it, it wasn't as if, you know, you, did, I, like, did I miss the conversation? The guy was not asking, hey, Jesus, what are the two greatest commandments? And Jesus is like, okay, I've got this. He just said, what is the greatest commandment? He's asking for a singular answer. 
And Jesus gives him two answers. He gives him a first, and then he gives him a second. And that's what he's saying here, which takes us to the second lesson here. Love others like they were the only one you had. Now, why do I say that? Well, Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy in his first part of his answer. Now he's quoting from Leviticus 19, verse 18. He talks about loving your neighbor as yourself. What's significant here, Jesus is speaking to a crowd of people. Though one person is speaking, everyone is listening. And the question is, are they really? Are they really listening? Because oftentimes, they're surrounded by people that they didn't want to love. Now, particularly, the immediate context here, as you can see, back in verse 34, it says, the Pharisees, they gathered together. They want to send this one representative to test him. The Pharisees were not known for loving others. They're known for loving themselves and their own supposed adherence to God's law. Jesus often, though, confronted them and their selfish interpretation of that, their self-righteous representation of that. See, Jesus here is not simply advocating for an emotional attachment or some type of abstract love. Jesus is instead saying here, loving here indicates a concrete responsibility. To love your neighbor as yourself means several things. First of all is to recognize you're not the only one on the planet. And furthermore, you're not the center of that planet. And second of all, also recognize the reality that you have a responsibility to those around you. Now, some people have asked the question, is Jesus actually asking, should we actually love the people who live next door to us? And that's what he means by neighbor. The truth is, no, that's not, he's not thinking in geographic proximity to you in the sense that they live next, to, next door to you. But quite honestly, if we could just take a moment of consideration, sometimes it's easier to love a coworker or a friend who we want to categorize as a neighbor, but maybe not necessarily love the neighbor who actually lives next to us in our apartments, our houses. People that we have not even learned their names because we don't spend the time to get to know them or care about them, show any kind of love for them. The context of what Jesus is talking about here, he is not concerned about geographic proximity or ethnic similarity. And that's, that's huge for this crowd right now because this crowd was a Jewish crowd thinking, okay, loving neighbor means maybe loving people from other tribes of Israel, but not necessarily from other nations, particularly Gentiles who are not Jewish people. And Jesus spent so much of his earthly ministry showing that love for those exact people, both Jew and Gentile, which makes the New Testament church so radical to love in this way. To love someone is to give someone what that person needs. In the same way that individuals are called to care for themselves responsibly and attune our lives to carry out God's will for each other, how we love one another. May I remind you of what we went back a number of months ago in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 Nicknamed three centuries later as the golden rule. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, that says, Whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Jesus gives that same type of citation here at the very end in verse 40. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now let's go back and consider these freshly now that they're recently put into our minds. And let's think through some implications of what has been taught here to us. Because there are some implications I think I want to make sure we do not miss. Number one, love for God cannot be used as a substitute as a love for neighbor. Love for God cannot be used as a substitute as a love for neighbor. This is a common challenge for the Pharisees and what they wanted to do. And this can still be true with people today who claim to love God and love His Word. People who like know the Bible very well. Maybe even are theologically trained. Maybe even have some impressive like doctoral degrees or master's degrees in things regarding the Scriptures. Friends, knowing God 
and supposedly loving God without loving neighbor actually brings into question whether or not you really know God and therefore love God. In fact, don't take my word for it. Listen to 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Friends, this is really where we kind of put to the test how much we really do indeed know God and therefore love God. There is a direct corresponding relationship that Jesus does not want us to miss, no more than he wanted this Pharisee to miss it. To say you love God and just give that first commandment, at that point, if he just stopped there, the Pharisee would have been like, score. I mean, like, I know this scripture so well. I've teached it to my kids, my grandkids. In fact, I know it forwards and backwards. I say it so many times a day. I sometimes sleep and dream about this text. I know this text. Because Jesus was basically saying, do you really, though? Do you really? Could I just have a moment of time and ask you, how well do you know Leviticus 19.18? You can just sort of see the catalog going on their mind, like, okay, Leviticus 19 is talking about this. Okay, what? okay uh-oh. I think I, know, I think I know where he's going here. And he says, to, second is to love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus marries these two together. You cannot claim you have a love for God and use it as a substitute as your love for neighbor. To confess one and not the other is to lie about both. The second implication is love for neighbor cannot be used as a substitute of love for God. And this kind of goes back the opposite direction. Why? Because there are a lot of people who believe themselves commendably, encouragingly, yet profoundly naively to be very loving. Very loving in the sense that they feel like, I am, I mean, just, you know, in humility, just, you know, just trying to be, keep it real here, but I just try to love everybody I meet. And the way that I know to do that is just sort of like, hey, wherever they're at, I'm gonna love them where they're at and not judge them where they're at. And I'm just gonna sort of like respect them and who they are and like, hey, that's you, you do you. And I'm gonna love you no matter who you are. And this idea that I can just love people without any direct connection or a context of what it actually means to love the way God defines love. I mean, already sort of head turning in Hebrews chapter 12 as the author of Hebrews is talking to these Hebrew Christians who are sort of wandering away from the faith and kind of being tempted to kind of go back to Judaism. And he's like, don't do that. Come back. Don't go back to that. That's like going back to the old ways before Christ died. Don't do that. And he says, listen, the Lord disciplines those whom he loves like a father disciplines his child. Like, wait, what? Wait, what? There's a category for love that includes discipline? I just thought there was a category for love that just included like jelly beans and like candy bars. You know, just nothing but affirmation and, and encouragement. You do you. You love you. I love you. Just giving just verbal hugs all day long. You cannot love your neighbor and use it as a substitute for loving God. You've got to recognize there is a false hope in the understanding that you can truly learn how it means to know people and love people apart from knowing the Word of God. I mean, think about it like this. God created every person on the planet, you and everybody else in this room, in this city, in this country, on this planet. God knows them better than you know them. In fact, God knows them better than, than they know themselves. And God has taught you and I how to exhaustively love them sacrificially. We cannot love others without loving the Lord. And having a love for the Lord means a love for his word and how to interact with each other. The third implication for this text I don't want you to miss, that sometimes can be missed here. Third, is that the Bible regularly assumes self-love. Now, let me just take you back to the text when he says in verse 39, he's just quoting again Leviticus here, verse 
He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is a popular teaching that's not unique to this year, this decade, our lifetime. It's basically just always comes up in some sort of different ways. This belief that you are the most important person, and as a result of that recognition that you be dialed in first, you need to learn to love yourself first, because you cannot love others unless you love yourself first. I want to just be very clear and be very, I hope, kind when I say this to you. You do not need any help. I do not need any help of learning how to love myself. The Bible assumes self-love because of how often, how instinctive, how natural and normal it is for you. But this is a very common, popular way in which the world sort of describes itself. My, one of my sons showed me a clip of a celebrity who was basically saying, you know, the greatest thing I've learned recently is I just got to love myself. I just got to love myself and got to take care of myself. And, gotta, and I thought, man, you know how well that would work in a marriage? I mean, that would make it like the shortest marriage on the, like the planet. You know, there's the husband, you know, and she's like, hey, I just want to, you know, do this. And he's like, she's like, well, I just want to do this. And like, well, I'm going to love myself first. And he's like, I'm going to love myself first. And like, well, there went that marriage. I mean, like, that's just not how that works, right? And in fact, in Philippians chapter 2, what we see here is the idea and how we're to consider others more highly than ourselves. And we'll go specifically go to Ephesians chapter 5, as husbands are talked about loving their wives, as Christ loved the church. For it says, no one ever hated himself. But you're thinking, Eric, I know people who hate themselves. I sometimes have hated myself. Okay, listen, let me be very clear. Sometimes you and I can make life-destructive habits, consuming alcohol, cutting ourselves, working ourselves to death, and we can wrongly think those decisions we're making are forms of self-hatred. I would actually want to pause and stop and say, actually, are they? Or actually they different ways of potentially at times loving yourself, but just in really destructive, sinful, twisted, discouraging ways. Now, why do I say this? Not because I'm trying to be like, you know, the meanie guy here. Because I want you to understand, the Bible assumes that one thing that we know really well is ourselves and how we love to be loved. In fact, that's just very true in relationship. We often measure each other's relationships on how well other people are responding to us or whether or not we want people to respond to us. So sometimes if we're introverted, the way you can love me is don't talk to me, right? Like, please, do not greet me. Stay as far away from me as possible. And whatever you do, do not try to get in the conversation with me. And if we're extroverted, the way you can love me is like, please, come talk to me. Bring like your 10 friends with you. All I want to do is talk to you. You want to come over? It's a sleepover. We'll have a blast. So this idea is instead, what we see here in the scriptures is that Jesus says, listen, to love your neighbor as yourself means you are so good at considering yourself. How are you taking that consideration and applying it to how you consider other people? How are you considering other people? Which takes us to number four. Love for others is inclusive, not exclusive. Neighbor would have been hotly debated by many of the Jews at that time, as I referenced a few minutes ago. Both within Judaism and outside, God wanted his people to not only love each other, but also to love others as a picture of his love for them. Let me just ask you a question for personal reflection. Who are persons, particular individuals, or people, like groups of persons, that you specifically have a hard time loving? I, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know the answer for yourself. Who, who is it? Maybe you just like came out of like the holiday, like, I got a fresh list. There's like my weird uncle, my crazy cousin, my neighbor who, yeah, they need help. You're like, I got a fresh list. Or there's like groups of people. Certain people that you don't like, they don't talk like you, they don't dress like you, they don't walk like you, they don't think like you, don't listen to music like you, whatever, whatever, that, whatever that group is. Jesus is like, hey, you want to obey God? Love your neighbor, love those people as yourself. Wholehearted love for God means seeing other people as God sees them. God created them in his image. And therefore, Deserving of dignity and respect. 
Michael Wilkins writes the following, Love is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person in which one gives oneself to another to bring the relationship to God's intended purposes. So say that again. Love is an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person in which one gives oneself to another to bring the relationship to God's intended purposes. Friends, this is how we learn how to love people is by looking at the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've cited it often because I think of it so regularly. Romans chapter five, verse eight. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Too often, we are waiting for either the person to be worthy of our object, of our love, or receptive to it, at least by thankfulness, if not by return of more of it back to us. That is not Christ-like love. That is not sacrificial love. That's not indeed at all what we learn from the Scriptures. The question we might ask is, what if I don't, the person doesn't love me back? Or what if I do love them, but they sin back to me? Remember the words of John Boyce, who says, of love, there are two principal offices, one to give, another to forgive. And the question, truly, that if you're a Christian here tonight, you should ask is, well, can a Christian really do this? Is this just an just a, you know, impossible exercise? It's not impossible. By the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, think about what Psalm 119, verse 34 says. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. But the question anybody in this room should be asking tonight, regardless of where you are before the Lord, is what happens when I fail? What happens when I don't love the Lord enough? with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind? What happens when I don't love my neighbor consistently enough? What should I do then? Should I just try harder? Should I hope God is graciously grading on a scale? Should I hope that God's not looking at the time and keeping a record? No, that's not at all what you should do. You should take all of that ineptitude, that inability, that impurity, that immaturity, and take it to Jesus Christ. And find not only in him a better example, but find in him the substitute that paid for your sins. He loved perfectly as we're reading. We're reading in here for ourselves. He loved perfectly, and all of that perfect forgiveness, that perfect love was credited to us. Our only hope is Christ. But because we have been forgiven by Christ, our desire now is to reflect Christ in us so that we love other people. Legally, only Christ loved God with his whole heart, with his whole soul, with his whole mind. Only he did it perfectly because the law law requires perfect conformity to it. Only Christ accomplished it. Yet God, out of his mercy and love towards us in Christ, enables us by the power of the Holy Spirit to love in response. For those of you who've been with us on Wednesday nights going through the study of the, the gospel-centered life, we talk about the relationship of the law to the gospel, the law to the gospel, how the law shows us we're a sinner, and how the gospel tells us how we can be free from our sin. But then in light of the gospel, how we're then brought back to the law of how we can show our love for God because we've been changed. But when we fail, we then go back to the gospel. For those of you who are not a Christian, here's the question for you to consider tonight. Who has your heart? Who has the devotion of your life? Tonight, you're with a bunch of Christians who believe Jesus is their hope. They'll be the first to tell you they don't love everybody perfectly. And embarrassingly, they don't love God perfectly. But their hope is not in their record of loving. Their hope is in God's record of loving and forgiving all those who have surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, his son. And the question is, would you do that tonight? Would you put your faith in Christ for the hope of forgiveness, for the assurance of pardon to be forgiven? For those of you who are Christians, God enables us to obey this command and love him, albeit imperfectly with all that we are 
so that God is delighted in his love for us that he receives from his people towards him. Our desire is to not make much of us, of how great we are. It's to make much of Jesus Christ and for people to see how great Jesus Christ is in us, of what he has done. To take a bunch of self-absorbed, self-righteous, worldly people who have been transformed by the power of the goodness of Jesus Christ and let that be reflected in our life. And it should start here in the household of faith. John 13, 4, 34, and 35, Jesus says, By this they will know that you are my disciples by your what? Love for one another. So may it start here in the household of faith.